All right, so what we are going to do now is uh, <coughs> we are going to show that if you have a normally convergent sequence of meromorphic functions, then the limit function is either uh, a meromorphic function or it is uh, identically the function which is infinity. Okay? And the importance of this theorem is that uh, uh, in the limit you can only get a meromorphic function and nothing worse. Okay? Because you see uh, meromorphic function is something that uh, has special kind of singularities, it has only poles as singularities. But when you take a limit of meromorphic functions, anything could have happened. You could have got a function with uh, uh, for example, uh, essential singularity, such a thing could have happened. Okay? Or you could have even got a function with non-isolated singularities. But all these things do not happen. The nice thing happens, namely if you take a normal limit of uh, meromorphic functions, you again get a meromorphic function. And the worst thing that can happen is that it is the function which is identically infinity, that is all. Okay? So, so let us go ahead and do that, the idea is uh, similar to uh, uh, the, the idea uh, uh, that uh, you know if you take a sequence of holomorphic functions then the, and you take a normal limit of holomorphic functions, then the limit function is either absolutely holomorphic, okay? it is holomorphic, perfectly holomorphic or it is identically infinity. Okay? Uh, so, so, let me start like this, uh, let uh, Fn be uh, uh, a sequence of maps from D to C union infinity, uh, D, uh, D inside the complex plane is a domain. Okay? Uh, of course, non-empty set, non-empty open connected set and uh, I am taking maps with values in C union infinity which is the extended complex plane and the reason for that is of course, you know we allow the value infinity now. right? And uh, uh, so, uh, suppose, uh, uh, so you know, suppose, uh, so let me write it here, suppose uh, uh, Fn, uh, oops. Suppose Fn tends to F, uh, uh, suppose Fn tends to F pointwise, pointwise on T, right? Suppose it is a pointwise convergence. So, uh, so that means that uh, F is also here, uh, so your F is also here, so let me write it somewhere here f is also a map from d to c union infinity and uh, fn tends to f pointwise on d you have to be uh, uh, when you say pointwise it means for every point and uh, when you say every point it means that fn of z tends to f of z for all z in d okay but then what does fn of z tend to f of z for all z in d mean it means that the distance between fn of z and f of z tends to zero as n tends to infinity for each z, z in d. And uh, what distance are you going to use? You just cannot use the usual Euclidean distance okay? because you are allowing the value infinity, you have to use a spherical metric. The distance under the, the spherical distance has to be used. Okay? So, let me write that down i e uh, f n z uh, tends to f z uh, as n tends to infinity for all z in d and that is supposed to mean that d the spherical distance of f n of z and the spherical distance between f n z and f of z that tends to 0 as n tends to infinity for every z in d. This is what pointwise convergence on d means and of course, you have to use a spherical distance because the function values might be uh, one of the points to which you are measuring. Uh, uh, from or to which you are measuring the distance could be the point at infinity. So, then you will have to use a spherical metric okay? that we have denoted by d sub s. All right, so, uh, you have a sequence of functions defined on a domain d and uh, at, the, at, the, at this moment they are only maps. Okay? I am not even uh, saying that they are continuous or something like that. But then we have been looking at so many uh, subsets of this uh, uh, this collection of maps. So, the first important subset is those which are continuous maps 
from d to c union infinity these are the continuous ones so i will write cts for continuous maps and continuous maps from d to c union infinity makes sense because d is anyway a domain it's a topological space it's a subspace of uh, the complex plane and c union infinity is a very nice uh, topological space in fact even a complete compact metric space okay because it's basically it's the uh, it's uh, it's isomorphic to the riemann sphere by the stereographic projection okay so you have uh, you have this and then there were smaller subsets in more important subsets there was also this subset of meromorphic functions on d so this is a subset of meromorphic functions on d and uh, 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 so this is meromorphic so meromorphic means that uh, you know uh, these are functions uh, which are uh, analytic that is holomorphic except for a subset which is a subset of necessarily isolated points and at each of those points uh, the function has a pole okay so analytic except for poles that's what meromorphic means all right and we have seen that uh, this this set of meromorphic functions is actually a field it's a field extension of the complex numbers uh, algebraically it's a field and then there's the further smaller subset of holomorphic functions on d or analytic functions on d so let me write here analytic that's a smaller subset and of course these are functions which are analytic everywhere on d there are, they don't have any singularities all right and uh, what we have uh, what we have seen is that if all the fn's uh, are in h of d then f is either in h of d or f is identically infinity that's what we have seen okay so so let me so uh, so let me write that here we saw if uh, all the fn's are in h of d then f is in h of d or f is identically infinity this is what we have seen uh, in the last lectures and it's a nice thing because it says that a sequence of holomorphic functions analytic functions can either go to infinity or it will go to a analytic function that's all you don't get in you you don't get something weird in between for example you don't even get a meromorphic function which is not holomorphic okay fine and uh, you you remember we used uh, basically we used two important things we used uh, the invariance of the spherical metric with respect to inversion and the other thing that we used was the hurwitz's theorem okay the theorem of hurwitz all right now what i want to say is that the a similar theorem is true if uh, uh, if you take fn's to be a, a meromorphic okay so if you take what we'll show today is that if all the fn's are in m of d then either f is in m of d or f is identically infinity so you are just extending this from the holomorphic case to the meromorphic case that's what we want to do okay and that's all that's also a very nice thing see the point is that you know why all these theorems are important is that uh, you see uh, on the one hand they are very believable i mean you expect them to happen because no, under normal convergence good properties are preserved okay you know from basic analysis if you have normal convergence which is actually locally uniform convergence so essentially it's uniform convergence locally okay and under uniform convergence all nice things happen the uh, uni if you take uh, uni uh, if you take a uniform limit of continuous functions you get a continuous function if you take a uniform limit of analytic functions you get an analytic function okay if you take a uniform limit of uh, integrals okay then that is the same as integrating the uh, uniform limit you can interchange limit and integral you can inter you can interchange you can do term wise differentiation if you are working with a series which is uniformly converging okay so uniform convergence is a very nice thing so under uniform convergence you expect everything to go smoothly so it's correct to expect that if you take a sequence of holomorphic functions if it converges normally that is locally uniformly then the the limit function is also holomorphic that's that's correct to expect and that's what happens similarly if you have sequence of meromorphic functions if it converges normally to a limit function the limit function is also meromorphic the only thing that you will have to worry about is the other extreme possibility which is that the function becomes identically infinity that is a possibility you cannot ignore okay but that's the worst thing that will happen and nothing in between these two happens so it's important that this is very very important because you know uh, uh, it should not happen that i start with a series of meromorphic functions 
are holomorphic functions. If they are holomorphic functions, they do not have any singularities. If they are meromorphic functions, they have poles. Okay? But in the limit, suddenly I should not get a function which is crazy enough to have say essential singularities or uh, I should not get a function which has a, a singularity which is non-isolated. I mean such horrible things should not happen and you can expect such horrible things should not happen because of normal convergence which is locally uniform convergence and this is exactly what we are trying to show in these lectures. I mean this is, so you know it is, this is always part of mathematics you guess that something nice will happen but then to prove it you will have to do some work, you will have to use some theorems, okay. So, um, well, um, so, so let us see, uh, so first of all I want to say uh, that see if you take the so first thing I want you to understand is that if all these fn's were uh, uh, not just maps but suppose they were continuous, okay, uh, then f also becomes continuous because uh, a uniform limit of continuous functions is continuous and a normal limit is a locally uniform limit, alright. So therefore, uh, so let me write that down, uh, if, uh, so, so let me use a different colour. Um, See if all the uh, if all f n are uh, continuous functions from d to c union infinity, okay, uh, and uh, 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 the f n's converge to f normally, uh, normally on d, normally on d, and this always means with respect to the spherical metric. So you know here I must tell you that in the in the previous slide uh, 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 here when I say if f n is uh, if the f n are all holomorphic then f is holomorphic or f is identical infinity here of course I am assuming that the convergence is not just pointwise but it is in fact normal uh, f n converges to f normally this is very important this is very very important of course normal convergence I did not mention it there but it is important okay. So, uh, pointwise convergence is useless, it does, it, it, pointwise limits can not uh, be as good as you want them to be, okay. But normal convergence is very, very important here, right. So, um, so you, suppose you take all uh, the fn's are continuous and assume that the convergence is normal on D, uh, then of course uh, f is also continuous and this is just uh, the, uh, uh, the, com the, the very well known fact that, that uniform limit of continuous functions is continuous all right you know that and uh, the point is that uh, normal limit is something that is locally a uniform limit okay. So it means that see given any point okay because you are working on an open set you can always find a closed disk surrounding uh, centred at that point which is inside your open set okay and such a closed disk is of course compact and normal convergence promises you that the convergence will be uniform on that closed disk. In particular, it will be uniform uh, on the on on the open disk, which is a subset of the closed disk. Okay, so whenever you have uniform convergence on a set, you will always have autom you will automatically have uniform convergence on any subset. Okay, all right. So uh, you get locally uniform convergence, and therefore the locally the limit function f will become continuous. And if you and continuity is a local property, so if a function is locally continuous, then it's continuous. If it's if you have a global function, okay. So uh, that's why f is continuous. Now, what is very very important is the following thing. Uh, if you add this condition that uh, now notice that uh, since you're uh, you're working with values in the extended plane, this is very very important. Not only f n makes sense, one by f n also makes sense, and not only f makes sense, 1 by f also makes sense, okay. So you see, uh, 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 you see, so let me say this, note then that uh, 1 by f n uh, also uh, uh, makes sense, uh, and, and uh, 1 by f also makes sense. So, uh, so let me say, uh, so makes sense, so let me, let me put something uh, more general, 1 by f n certainly makes sense as a map from uh, d to c union infinity, okay. Uh, 1 by f n of z is uh, 
uh, is very well defined if f on if f n of z is uh, infinity then 1 by f n of z is 0 if f n of z is 0 then 1 by f n of z is infinity and if f n of z is a non zero complex number then 1 by f n of z is the inverse of that complex number so it's very well defined so this 1 by f n is also the, these 1 by f n also make sense okay uh, and not only that uh, similarly uh, 1 by f also makes sense okay any function uh, uh, on the domain which has values in the extended plane has an inverse okay for example and if you, for example if you take the worst case which is uh, the function which is identically zero you don't have to worry its inverse is the function which is identically infinity okay but it's not an inverse in the algebraic sense that you know the function multiplied by the inverse will not give you one okay you should not go ahead and write the function zero multiplied by the function one infinity is equal to one that's not correct okay but this is a convention it's a convention okay so uh, what we say is if you take the function which is identically zero then its inverse function is defined to be the function which is identically infinity but it is not an inverse in the algebraic sense you have to be careful about that okay fine so but what is the advantage of this the advantage of this is that you know uh, 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 if you are looking at meromorphic functions then the inverses of meromorphic functions are also meromorphic functions that is the advantage okay so now what I want to tell you is that you see if uh, suppose I assume that f n converges to f normally okay the on d with respect to the spherical metric then it also happens that uh, 1 by f n converges to 1 by f uh, normally on d with respect to the spherical metric that will also happen that is just because of the fact that the spherical metric is invariant with respect to inversion okay so uh, so let me write that note also that uh, uh, 1 by fn converges to 1 by f normally on d with respect to the spherical metric because uh, the distance spherical distance between fn of z and f of z is the same as the spherical distance between 1 by f n of z and 1 by f of z this is just the invariance of the spherical metric under inversion okay I told you that the inversion on the complex plane if you transport it via the stereographic projection to the Riemann sphere what what it will give you is it will give you a rotation of the Riemann sphere it will give you a rotation of the Riemann sphere by 180 degrees okay so uh, and under uh, under rotation uh, of uh, on under rotations of a sphere uh, the distance the spherical distance between two points on the sphere will not change obviously okay so uh, this is something that we have seen before um, so the point is that it's beautiful if fn converges to f normally then 1 by fn converges to also 1 by f normally and this is these are equivalent mind you fn converges to f if and only if 1 by fn converges to 1 by f okay it's a, it's a simultaneous statement they are, they, 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 these are two simultaneous statements and both of them are equivalent okay so the the point is that uh, therefore what i'm trying to tell you is the philosophy is as follows whenever you are looking at functions with uh, values in the extended plane always think automatically of the reciprocal functions also the 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 inverse of those functions okay they also make sense okay that is the advantage okay now uh, what i want to tell you is that you see uh, suppose uh, now let let me do the following thing suppose all the uh, 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 suppose all the functions fn were all meromorphic okay what i want to actually say is that f will be meromorphic okay and uh, and that is that is the important result that we want to see okay so now let me let me assume that suppose uh, uh, fn are all meromorphic functions on d okay okay then the theorem is that f is f is also meromorphic on d so here is so here is a theorem then f is meromorphic or the the, the other extreme case is that f is identically infinity okay so this is the theorem okay if fn is meromorphic 
uh, if each fn is meromorphic then the, then the normal limit of fn namely f that is meromorphic or it is identically infinity. What it means is that the, no, the, the limit function will have uh, if at all it has singularities they will only be isolated they will be poles and you would not get anything worse than that ok. Now what I want you to understand is that you see first and foremost fn uh, are meromorphic ok and that will imply that 1 by fn are also meromorphic ok. See because see the reciprocal of a meromorphic function is also a meromorphic function right and uh, uh, the you see uh, so this so this makes sense for uh, so this all this is okay if you know uh, 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 with a with a small modification all right uh, this is provided fn is not uh, identically infinity okay because a function which is identically infinity uh, uh, we do not I mean we do not uh, uh, you know it is an extra function that we add all right we do not consider it to be meromorphic we consider it as an extreme case the function which is identically infinity ok. But its inverse will be the function which is identically 0 and that is a nice constant function it is a holomorphic function also ok. So uh, when I write this I am assuming that uh, the fn uh, that I am looking at is not identically infinity. And when you may ask uh, what if that fn is identically infinity in that case 1 by fn is defined to be the function which is identically 0 and that is by definition it is a constant function it is holomorphic ok. So uh, that case is always you know you, you keep it separate when, when a function is identically infinity ok. And uh, also this case that if fn is identically 0 then 1 by fn is defined to be identically infinity alright and so you know you should also. Uh, I, I also throw out the, the case when fn is not identically 0, uh, when, uh, when fn is identically 0 I, th I throw out that case ok. Because then 1 by fn becomes the function which is identically infinity and uh, the function is which is identically infinity is not considered as a meromorphic function ok. Because it has it is a meromorphic function should have only poles only at uh, you know uh, it has only poles and they, they should be an isolated set of points at the poles it goes to infinity but it cannot go to infinity everywhere right. Now what I want you to understand is that see uh, uh, I want you to see that therefore uh, since 1 by fn's are all uh, meromorphic uh, 1 by fn's are uh, including the case of uh, 1 by fn being infinity ok all these 1 by fn's are of course continuous mind you because this set of meromorphic functions is actually contained in the set of all continuous maps into because it is continuous because uh, mind you at a pole you are allowing the value infinity for a function. So uh, what you must understand is that uh, all these 1 by fn's are uh, in fact continuous functions and therefore if you take uh, if fn tends uh, normally to f then uh, because of the invariance of the spherical metric under inversion 1 by fn will tend normally to 1 by f and 1 by f will certainly be continuous that is because each 1 by fn is certainly continuous even if 1 by fn is the function which is identically infinity it is continuous mind you even the extreme case. So what I want you to uh, rem uh, understand is that if fn tends to f normally implies 1 by fn tends to 1 by f normally this happens and this implies uh, that uh, this 1 by f is certainly a continuous function from d to c union infinity and this includes the case when 1 by fn is uh, I mean when uh, when 1 by f is even identically the function which is infinity ok. Mind you the function which is identically infinity is here but it is not here it is not in the meromorphic functions by definition right. Fine, so uh, what we want to show is that we want to show that this 1 by f is meromorphic that is what we want to show. Now um, I, I want you to, uh, so, um, so let me say uh, another uh, thing that I wanted to say but I did not and that is that uh, how do you see 1 by fn is meromorphic it is very very simple you see look at the places where the function fn 
has poles, uh, this is an isolated set of points and 1 by f n will have zeros at those points. Okay. If a function has a pole at a point then its reciprocal will have a 0 at that point and the order of the 0 will be exactly equal to the order of the pole. Okay. And if a function has a 0 at a point then its reciprocal will have a pole. So you see if you take f n uh, to be a meromorphic function then there is uh, uh, it is analytic outside an isolated set of points which are poles okay. and outside an isolated set of points you will get an open subset of D and inside that again the set of zeros will again be an isolated set of points because you see the set of zeros of an analytic function are always isolated and this isolated set of points which are the zeros of fn they will be the isolated set of points which are the poles of 1 by fn. So 1 by fn has only poles as singularities so 1 by fn is meromorphic you have to understand that okay. So um, now you see what I want to say is that uh, so we had we had uh, defined this set d infinity of f this d infinity of f is the is a set of uh, points in d uh, where f takes the value infinity so d infinity of f is uh, so let me write that this set of all uh, is it belonging to d such that uh, uh, f of z is equal to infinity and this is just f inverse of infinity and this is a closed set it is a closed subset of D okay. and uh, well uh, uh, and, and, and it is closed because the point infinity is a closed point in the extended plane because it corresponds to the north pole on the Riemann sphere okay, under the stereographic projection and the inverse image of a closed set under a continuous function is closed f is continuous and so uh, D infinity of f is a closed set okay. and the point is that uh, if 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 you assume that f is not identically infinity, okay, then you are just saying that d. This is the same as saying that d infinity of f is a proper subset of t. Okay, uh, d infinity of f is a proper subset. Okay, uh, because if d infinity of f is all of d, then it's the same as saying f is identically infinity. Okay, so d infinity of f is a proper subset of t. Uh, what we want to show is that we want to show f is analytic except for poles. So you want to show that this d infinity of f which is a closed set uh, these are certainly points where f takes the value infinity okay. So you want to show that they are all poles and in, for, in particular you want to show that this d infinity of f mind you uh, it is isolated that is the see that is the important point. Why it could be connected it could be a curve after all it is a it is a subset of a domain in the complex plane a subset of a domain is an open set and an open set can contain curves it can even contain a, a sequence of points which has a limit it can it can contain so many things so uh, it is not even clear that d infinity is is, a, is an isolated set of points okay so that we have to prove okay so that see that is the important part Okay, that you have to observe. So, uh, of course, you know the um, uh, the way you handle it is by looking at one by f, okay? Because one by f is now there for you to worry, to to uh, you know uh, uh, play with because one by f is already continuous. You see, that's the point. So you have it here. One by f is here. It's it's already continuous. All right, and you you can use it. All right, and on one by f n converges normally to 1 by f so you can use that. So, le so let me say the following thing you see let us take uh, let us take this uh, let us take this d minus d infinity if you take this d minus d infinity uh, this uh, if you take f of d minus d infinity this will go into the complex plane okay because you have thrown out d infinity which is the set of points where f takes the value infinity so at the other points which is in the points of d minus d infinity f will take a value other than infinity so the only values other than infinity in the external complex plane are complex values so f so that means this and mind you d minus d infinity is open d minus d infinity is open because d infinity is closed all right and uh, now you have the function f 
you have a function f which is defined on this open set d minus d infinity and it is taking complex values and what is this f? This f is a again a normal limit of f n. See f is a normal limit of f n on all of d. So, it is also a normal limit of f n on a subset of d. Okay. If f, f n tends to f normally on d itself, so f n will tend to f normally on any subset of d. Okay. So, since d minus d infinity is a subset of d, f n will tend to f normally on d minus d infinity and what is this f on d minus d infinity? It is a complex valued function, all right. Just let me think for a moment. Uh, I am I am trying to look at uh, I am trying to look at a point where f has a uh, has a value takes the value infinity. So I am I am trying to look at a point z naught in d infinity. So uh, I want to say it's a pole. So I want to say if z naught belongs to d infinity, I want to say f of f has a pole at z naught. But the way to verify that f has a pole at z naught is to verify is this is equivalent to verifying that one by f has a zero at z naught. So I'll have to show that one by f has a zero isolated zero at f naught at, at z naught. Okay. But then uh, what I'll have to show is that one by f is analytic in a neighborhood of z naught in a deleted neighborhood of z naught. I'll have to show that first. Okay. And uh, uh, I. I'm, I must make sure and, and then I will get that uh, z naught is an isolated 0 of 1 by f. 1 by f being uh, analytic in a neighborhood of z naught will tell me that f is analytic in a deleted neighborhood of z naught and z naught is a pole. Okay. And if and, and now I, uh, this will tell me that uh, f is meromorphic okay. that is what I will have to do. So, uh, so how do I show that? Uh, 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 see the, the the ideas of the proof are similar to the ideas that we used in the earlier lectures. Okay, so so let me do the following thing. Uh, so d infinity of f is actually uh, uh, d zero of one by f. Okay, so d zero of one by f is the set of all z belonging to d such that f one by f of z is zero. Okay. Mind you, one by f is uh, makes sense. It's a continuous map, okay, and therefore uh, one by f of z equal to zero will be the locus of points where one by f takes the value zero. It's the inverse image of zero under one by f, which is continuous. So it's a mind you, it's a closed set, okay, because the single point zero is a closed set in in C union infinity. Any single point is a closed set. So so this is so if you want, let me write this. This is just one by f inverse of zero. So take a point z not in d infinity of f, okay. Then uh, take a point z not in d infinity of f. Then uh, uh, what happens? Uh, this is a this is a point where uh, f takes the value infinity. So one by f takes the value zero, okay. Uh, since one by f takes the value zero and one by f is continuous, okay. There is a small disk surrounding z not. In fact, even a closed disk surrounding z not, where one by f. Uh, is bounded okay because it's just continuity see 1 by f is a map from it's a continuous map from d to c union infinity okay and if you use continuous so it in particular it means it's continuous at z not also okay that means that uh, and 1 by f of z not is zero okay so what it means what does continuity what will continuity tell you it will tell you that given an epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0 such that uh, if you make the distance between, uh, 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 so uh, I can use the usual distance because I am now going to, um, because I am on D, uh, if you make the distance between z and z0 uh, less than delta, okay, then the distance in the spherical metric between f of 1 by f of z and 1 by f of z0 by the way which is 0 this quantity is 0 that's, that can be made less than epsilon. This is just continuity the definition of continuity of 1 by f at z0 given an epsilon okay I can make 1 by f z uh, to be as close as I want to 0 to within an epsilon distance of 0 if I choose z sufficiently close to z0 and how sufficiently close that is what is decided by the delta that is that is a delta okay and 
you know I can I can do I can even put less than or equal to that is because you know I can choose a smaller disk uh, such that uh, a smaller disk centered at Z0 radius delta such that the closed disk including the, circ the boundary circle that also lies inside uh, D because D is after all an open set. Okay, I, can, I can always choose this disk sufficiently small in D okay, uh, because uh, D is an open set and then I can make sure that even the boundary of the disk is inside D, I can do that right. And um, you see uh, what does see what does this tell you? This tells you that you see uh, uh, the distance between 1 by f and 0, uh, 1 by f is very close to 0 okay and uh, you, you see you also have this fact that the 1 by f n's they converge to 1 by f mind you normally. So, uh, the first thing I want you to understand is that uh, uh, since uh, 1 by f n converges to 1 by f normally, the 1 by f n will converge to 1 by f uniformly on this closed disk, that is because this closed disk is compact. And because of that all the 1 by f n's beyond a certain stage, they will also take values in a neighborhood of 0 okay and that means that in a neighborhood of 0 all the 1 by uh, in the, in a neighborhood of z0 okay uh, all the 1 by f n's beyond a certain stage they are all going to be bounded and that means that they are all going to be analytic because mind you our originally our f n's were all meromorphic so 1 by f n's are also meromorphic but you know a meromorphic function if it is bounded at a point then it that has to be a good point. If a meromorphic function is uh, bounded in the neighborhood of a point okay, uh, then uh, you know uh, uh, in it cannot uh, it, it can assume in, in that point has to be a good point by the Riemann's removable singularities theorem. What can happen is in the neighborhood of that point it can have some poles. Uh, because it is a meromorphic function, but it cannot have a pole because at a pole it will take the value infinity, I, I am putting the restriction that it is taking values close to 0. So, it means that in a neighborhood of Z0 all these f n s 1 by f n s they are all going to be analytic and since all the 1 by f n s are analytic and they converge uniformly to 1 by f in this disk centered at Z0, 1 by f becomes analytic at Z0 and once 1 by f becomes analytic at Z0 z0 becomes a 0 of 1 by f which is now an analytic function therefore it is isolated. So z0 become as an isolated 0 of 1 by f and that is the that will tell you that uh, uh, z0 will be an isolated pole for f. So what this argument tells you is that every z0 where uh, f takes the value infinity is actually a pole of f and therefore f is meromorphic and that is that ends the proof. Okay. So, let me write that down. So, let me write these things in words. Uh, uh, note that uh, uh, 1 by f uh, is bounded uh, near 0 uh, in mod z minus z naught z naught equal to delta. Uh, also uh, 1 by f n converges to 1 by f uniformly. So, I am abbreviating it as u f l y on mod z minus z naught less than or equal to delta because of normal convergence and because mod z minus z naught less than or equal to delta is compact. Uh, uh, so, uh, for n sufficiently large uh, the 1 by f n s are bounded uh, near 0 uh, in uh, mod z minus z not less than or equal to delta okay uh, and uh, and uh, hence uh, uh, by if you want Riemann's removable singularities theorem
uh, Z naught is 0 of uh, 1 by f and of course here I am saying that uh, 1 by f is uh, 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 1 by f is analytic because 1 by f n's are all analytic uh, beyond a certain stage all the 1 by f n's are analytic and 1 by f n's tend to 1 by f and it is uniform convergence therefore 1 by f is analytic. So 1 by f is analytic and it has a 0 at z naught so it is an isolated 0 okay. Uh, note that uh, uh, 1 by f n n sufficiently large are analytic. Uh, so, 1 by f is analytic uh, uh, being a normal limit being a uniform limit. So, u f is abbreviation for uniform. Uh, uh, so, this all this happens in mod z minus z not less than or equal to delta. Uh, you may need to make delta smaller if you want, but that is not a problem. Uh, the point is that uh, Z naught is thus uh, a 0 uh, of uh, the, an the analytic function 1 by f in mod Z minus Z naught in mod Z minus Z naught less than or equal to delta uh, uh, so it is isolated. Thus, uh, f of z has a pole at z naught. So, f is actually a meromorphic function, and that's the end of the proof. So, it's a very nice fact that uh, if you take a normal limit of meromorphic functions, barring the extreme case that the normal limit is identically infinity the limit is again in a meromorphic function okay so uh, so that that ends the proof of this fact okay and uh, what we saw last class was that if you put the additional condition that the fn's are all holomorphic and you assume that the limit function is not identical infinity then the limit function is also holomorphic and why is that true now you can see that if you take the fn's additional to be holomorphic you know and if it is not and the limit is not identically infinity you know by whatever we have proved now you know that the limit is meromorphic okay. But if it is really meromorphic at a certain point namely if it has a pole at a certain point then what will happen is that its reciprocal will have a 0 and Hurwitz's theorem will say that if 1 by f has a 0 then 1 by f n will start having zeros as, as n becomes large. But the moment 1 by f n start having zeros f n will start having poles and that will that is not possible if you assume f n to be holomorphic therefore you see that uh, all the uh, if all the f n are holomorphic then f also has to be holomorphic or it has to be identically infinity okay so I will stop here.